Welcome to the Mighty Dragon. Our guest today is Youssef Kokoa, a Moroccan-British actor. He's recognised for his role as Captain Deveau in the movie Napoleon. However, this isn't the first time that Youssef has worked with the legendary filmmaker Ridley Scott. He was in the house of Gucci too. In this episode, we'll talk about Youssef's career, his approach to acting, and his experience working with Ridley Scott and the masterpiece Napoleon. Youssef, welcome to The Mighty Dragon. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I would love to speak to you about your experiences in Napoleon, but I've got a few other questions about um, your career. How did you get into acting? I've uh, been acting since I was a little kid. Uh, grew up in Morocco. I uh, did all the school plays and stuff. I went to uni. Yeah. Uh, my, my uni had a very strong theatre programme, dance programme, and I just I got immersed into it all. And... Uh, and when I graduated uni, I started making films with my friends and that got me into the film industry in America and then just sort of carried on from there. Yes. So we know you as Marshal DeVoe in uh, Napoleon. What do you like about your character? The Marshal Davout was known as the Iron Marshal and uh, was described by many as uh, um, never looking happy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but when I dug deep into his history, I found that his soldiers were the ones that were the most well-equipped. They were capable of surviving the longest, marching the furthest, wow. aiming the best. So they would they would they would be always be on target. Um, and an interesting note is that Marshal Davout, who was devoted devoted to Napoleon, yes. um, was present at every battle except for two, Trafalgar and Waterloo. Wow. Found, found very interesting. And when Davout died, Napoleon said that uh, France had lost one of its brightest uh, lights. Right. Um, and then the third final most interesting thing, which I discovered very late, is that Davout wore glasses, uh, which to, to us today doesn't mean much, but... Um, Back then, men never wore glasses, even if they needed needed them, because it was a sign of weakness. And I found it wonderful that he he openly wore them, and even fa very famously fashioned a, a battle strap uh, that he would wear during the battle. Which, if you watch the movie, and, and in, certainly in the longer version, you'll see we Davu. I'm sometimes wearing the strap, sometimes not, depending on what campaign we're on, whether we're in, indoors or whatever. But yeah. he was unashamedly, you know, he wore these things in public publicly. Uh, that that in combination with his fearsome reputation, I thought was quite wonderful that he didn't actually care about what people thought of him in that regard. So it seems like he only cared what Napoleon thought of him. Only cared what Napoleon thought, uh, kept his own company, uh, was was you know. It's like when you talk to these geniuses today, uh, they do think, do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, and they just don't care because they, it doesn't touch them what you think of them. They're, they've got a focus and they've got a brilliance inside them that is all they need. And I kind of got the sense that that's, you know, and, and people like that can be devoted to a cause or to a person. And if, and if you've got them in your camp, Forget about it. I think Napoleon was very, very good at collecting people like that and keeping them on side. You know, I think he even yeah. married Davu. Davu married one of Napoleon's like sort of sisters or cousins or something like that. But there was a sort of familial link there. Um, yes. You know, and this is a man who had nothing and sort of worked his way up. Uh, you know, I think uh, and Napoleon shared the same similar sort of history. Yeah, I think he truly sounds an interesting and fascinating person. Fascinating from history. guy, yeah. There's yeah. a great book called The Iron Marshal, which is worth a read, you know, if anybody's. Yes. Oh, I might check that out. And I guess you've portrayed a lot of different people f throughout your career, but how do you prepare for a character from the 1800s, say, the time of Napoleon? Thankfully, there are so many, there is so much that, that we're called upon to do in prep for a movie. I'm speaking of movies in particular here, that that can sometimes take over. So I worked with Ridley on House of Gucci. I was quite overweight, uh, which is which was suited the character at the right. time. But of course, Napoleon's army famously, you know, uh, suffered um, 
horrible defeat and starvation when they tried to invade Moscow. Um, they they starved. They cannibalized each other. And so there was a real question, well, you know, I can be in this movie, but um, it, it might look quite out, out of place to be as overweight as I am in those retreat scenes. So it's not about showing up emaciated and gaunt, but like showing up at a, in a state that I could then from there go to looking emaciated. So, so most of my preparation in the early days was just about losing the weight. And I lost a lot of weight for, for, for Napoleon. Right. Um, the rest of it was just because it's a historical figure researching and reading as much as I can if you're playing real people as a second film I've done with Ridley and the second time I played a real person and yes. thankfully you know thankfully there are novels and things written about them so you get a good idea of what people think about themselves but both with Namir Kirdar in um, House of Gucci and in this one I had I was lucky enough to have their own writing at my disposal um so reading Kirador's books about the Middle East and about you know the future of the Middle East and you get yes. a real good sense about who he was and hear him hearing him hearing his voice through his words you can really formulate a good and I knew I knew all I had to do was was read his books and memorize um so he ran a company called this is this is house in house of Gucci yes um, he ran a company called Investcor, a corporation, very famous bank, you know, investment uh, firm. And um, I knew that all I had to do was memorize their real profit and loss and all that stuff. So um, I got my hands on their financials. I memorized about 15 years worth of numbers that spanned the movie. And um, that's all I needed to do to prep. It was very simple. Uh, for Davu, I read uh, all the books about him. I worked, you know, worked on losing the weight, but then also read his journals. It, there, it, there was a, a collection of um, writings about his thoughts while on the battlefield, which is again fascinating. Davu and the Art of War was the name of this book. It's in the original French. I had to find it from a, a used yes. book store in France and get it, you know, shipped over. Um, but that was fascinating because it was a real peek into into how he thought. Not that the not that the script of Napoleon had any room for any of that, but mm. it's just about prepping, prepping your character, and then um, showing up and looking right, and then thinking right, and then hopefully the rest follows suit. You know. Yes, I, I found Napoleon the way he was portrayed actually quite a likable character, which surprised me. Were yeah. you surprised by the script? I will, um, yeah, I mean, look, it's 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 funny, you know. If if the film that was on, is, that's in the cinema was called uh, "On the Road to Waterloo," it would uh, people would watch it differently. Yes, if it's called Napoleon. It needs to sort of span Napoleon's life, and it's just so immense. And you know, Ridley, I think a little halfway through production realized he'd had a you know he had a five hour movie on his hands, and Apple just said to him, "Well, listen, just." <laughs> Carry on, and we'll put it out as a long movie. If we yes, have. so there is another version out there which which really goes even you know shows a lot more, a lot of other. I mean, to go from five, four hours in a bit to two and a half hours means there's a lot of story that's cut out. You know, so incredible, truly incredible. And were there any funny behind the scenes moments that you can share with us? Yeah, I think there's. Um, you know, uh, we all had to. Learn, you know, we all. Had to ride horses. Uh, that's that could be a lot of fun, but also, um, you know, like the weight loss stuff as well. So riding the horse was was great, but we had these big, massive, heavy capes that we yeah. had to wear, and the capes would 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 sort of go backwards down the horse's hind legs. Um, and of course, as as you're trotting along, we're, they're, they're connected by a chain, so these chains would start to pull us back as we were riding, which is hilarious. Oh. <laughs> uh, and also the winter retreat as soon as i was ready and in shape uh then they slapped a massive bearskin sort of bare fur coat on <laughs> the whole thing because of course it's winter <laughs> so no one can see anything anyway which is yeah <laughs> um, generally throughout your career how do you prepare for a new character and immerse yourself in that role it all depends on what the production like I, over the years I used to have a set way of doing things, which is 
what I called filling my brain. If I had enough, like a good two or three months to prepare, which is ideal, uh, I immerse myself just by by researching the role fundamentally. I, I, I draw a distinction between fundamental research and developmental research. I've talked about this before. Where, where like developmental research, it's like if you discover a spoon and apply developmental research in in ten years, you'll have thousands of different kinds of spoon because you develop the one you develop the one idea. But if you apply a fundamental research principle to it, then in ten years you've got spoons, knives, forks, you've got other you know you got you've got ladles, you've got you expand on it because you're you're not researching on developing the thing itself you're looking at what it means fundamentally and then right. and then researching that and expanding on that so with a character it's very important i think to apply that fundamental principle yes i'm playing a soldier so i could spend 3 months knowing everything about what it means to be a soldier and i think i think sometimes american re, american prep focuses on that because they're, they're they're able to give it that kind of focus. And I think what where we stand out as Brits and as a European actors is that we really have this idea like, okay, you're playing a soldier, but what is what is fundamental to the story? Who are you really? What's going on? You're a, a soldier, but also a father. You're a soldier, but you're a pawn in a bigger game. So let's research that. And it goes on you and you can just filter out you know, create this cobweb of of inspiration, read anything, and, and usually usually allowing one's intuition and emotions to lead you where you want to go. Because once you begin, once you have the idea that you're going to be researching this part and working on this part, your subconscious is now primed for it. And so if you start daydreaming about whatever, it could be it literally, it could be anything, water lilies, randomly water lilies keep coming into your head and so you it's a you'd be foolish not to follow that to pull at that thread so you start pulling at it and yanking at it and then you discover a painting and in that painting is a is a, a person lying asleep in surrounded by water lilies and you realize it's actually that that's pulling you to and you so and on it goes so you just follow your intuition follow your emotion follow your subconscious and fill your brain up with as much information as possible and then about three weeks before two weeks before tops you just stop you let it all go you don't think about it at all and i and then just learn the lines learn the script learn the story understand where you are whenever you're going to film one scene where am i in the story in that scene and you really get a you really get a good path carved out in your head for your for your part and your arc and then show up on set and just trust that all that information is in there and that your subconscious has had enough time to blend it all and work it all together and mesh it all together. Yes. Every once in a while, I need to do some deeper work, working on the subconscious and all that stuff. There's all, all sorts of techniques to do that. And sometimes very rare. In the beginning, I did this, obviously, because it's how you're, tra you're trained. I do it rarely now, going through the script and analyzing it academically. You know, what do I want in this scene? What's my obstacle? All that stuff. But that's available too. And then lately, I mean, mainly since working with Ridley, I've I've just sort of skipped forward to basically getting an in, just knowing what I need in order to make me as efficient and uh, as good a collaborator as possible yes like i know very simply all i need to do is memorize all these numbers and learn my lines and i'm working with our pacinos and i know he likes to improvise so i'll spider diagram the scene and i'll have and i remember with, with pacino i this i had about 47 57 different versions of where the scene could go and i did i pre-planned it and i'd watched i watched every interview he ever gave that's available on youtube i, I, I it was covid time so yes. i had to do that until i really got a sense I, I felt like i sort of knew the guy i could yeah. see how he thought and that this his his mannerisms and why his mannerisms were the way they were, what his brain was doing while, you know, why he would sort of like rub his hands in the middle of an interview and rub his thigh and stuff like, um, 
And so I thought, if he's got this line in the script, what could he say instead of it? Or how would he improvise on that? And I just sort of guessed my way through. And, and yes. I just, So when I sat down in front of him, I was just so ready. <laughs> ready. That, that is the most prepared I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> like, time interviewing. <laughs> it's also like, you know, you've got Ridley Scott, Adam uh, Al Pacino, Jared Leto, Adam Driver, you know, Jack Houston, there's all these people, Stephanie, you know, Gaga is in the background uh, walking about. And so you want to be able to sit down there and think to yourself, there is no one here, no one who has memorized the last 15 years of financials of the company that I'm, uh, of the guy who I'm playing. Yeah. That knows the profit and loss from two years ago. No, no it's incredible. one. incredible. No, I know it all. And so I had this, I'm just very comfortable. It seems and like you live and breathe that part. Yeah. I mean, look, that, that's, that, this is my point. It's, it's living, breathing that part, not having done much more than just memorize numbers. Yeah. It's, I'm now looking for that one thing that just tips the scale. Just that one thing I need to do. And, I, and, and, I, and all I need to do is that. And it will make me live and breathe the part. What do you learn from working with Ridley Scott? Oh, wow. I mean, I'll preface it by saying I, 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 I was at the honor of winning the BAFTA uh, breakthrough or being, being one of the chosen, one of the BAFTA breakthroughs that were chosen for that year. And they ask, they ask you, who do you, who would you like to talk to? Who would you like to mentor you? And I said, Ridley Scott, I know he's, I know he's a director, but I really, that's who I want. That's who I want to learn from. What I learned from Ridley Scott, practically speaking, is just how much how much preparation is actually an active ingredient in completing a task, completing a task entirely. That the prep is everything. Without the prep, things go wrong. So he never panics on set because he's covered all his bases already. Uh, he's never over budget. He's never, he always runs on time. In fact, he raps early. We rap Gucci a month early. You know, he's, and he never panics or worries because he's thought of everything already. Right. So he preps for a long time. He's very famously you know, story does his own storyboards. So he, because he's an artist and a painter, so he he storyboards his own. He, he does his own storyboards, so he knows what everything is going to look like at all times. Wow! I'll share you that he's just created the world already. He's budgeted it already, and then you take that a step further. Add the experience that he's got, and he shoots with six cameras. So, and he likes the first take. So he's very efficient and quick. You finish the day early with an eight-hander scene and Gucci around a table, you know, food and drink, people coming and going. I mean, that's two days normally. Um, we finished it in three hours. Um, and then and then that even and then that day had a different scene. <laughs> that was also massive. So, you know, uh, he's extremely well organized. He hires very, 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 very competent people on the crew and stuff. Right. masters all of them could just all of them could run their own studios you know and yet and yet they're there behind the camera you know yeah he's got, he's got masters of the trade working for him he has his editor on set he edits as he goes you know he'll come up wow. and get, the first page is cut just forget about it yeah because he'll go are we pushing in from the door oh yeah yeah no, we're going to push in from there and then he goes all right so we don't need this bit no okay cool first page is cut guys so he's already he's editing as he's filming you know so it's it's ultra efficient. And he can do that because he's prepped. Yes. Give yourself more time to prepare what you're going to do in advance. It's not, it's not about thinking or daydreaming about what you want to do. You actively begin it. You begin the job. But the beginning of the job is prepping. It's like chefs who come in early and they, and they get their mise en place ready. They prep all their carrots and their spices and their this. And it's all laid out. And they've got, they're experienced enough to know that, you know, that onion is not enough. I'm going to need to do double that. So I, once I finish all my prep, I go back and I and I do more onions. So because yes. I know I'm going to need more and all that stuff, backups of backups and everything and everything ready to go. And then 
for every scenario. If it goes wrong, what do I have to do? I'll just move it. And he and he would do that. And like on, on again on Gucci, they had this massive sort of twenty people around a, a dinner table scene. And it just got very cold. They all got cold outside, and uh, and they went. Listen, let's just go inside. So they reset inside. But he had already had that as a possibility, and and in and in half an hour, the the entire set was moved inside, and they reset, started again, did the whole thing again from inside. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a monumental change. I mean, if something like that can destroy uh, most productions. And so what I learned from Ridley is not just his efficiency, which is what we all talk about, you know, he uses six cameras, you know, all that. But it's really, it's really the commitment to preparation as a means to an end. I think we can all learn something from that. Absolutely. Can't we? What challenges have you faced in your acting career and how did you overcome them? Look, I'm a uh, so so. I'm I'm a you know I'm an Arab actor. Arab. I'm I'm Moroccan. Some people don't think Moroccans are Arabs, but we we are. Um, I'm a mixed race. I I can pass for either. Yeah. I'm a uh, I'm very tall, very big. I started off in America, and I'm you know I'm bald. My teeth aren't straight. So the challenges I had were purely aesthetic. People just didn't know what box to put me in for a long time. And I entered the industry ready ready to be versatile because I've trained a lot in many different styles, taking on many different works. I can do this and that and the classical and this and the theatre as well. I spent my, the first 15 years of my life in, in as a, as a journey, I'm still a journeyman actor, but really, I was a touring actor. Um, and what happens is, I realized uh, halfway through that the versatility was the problem, especially in Europe, you know, or in the UK rather. In the UK, that was a problem. Um, that being able to be anything and anyone made people's jobs more difficult. So I really didn't work. And it wasn't until I decided, you know, I'm just make a decision here. Mm. Um, and so I, I went, the, I said, I am an, I, who am I? I feel like I'm, I feel Arab. That's my culture. That's my heritage. Let's just go in that direction fully. I grew the beard out. I put some Arabic music on my show reel. I just kept pushing this and I niched down, you know, um, the riches are in the, niches as they say in america which should be niches but you know <laughs> the riches so if you find a niche and focus in on that and zero down into it and things start to start to open up especially in a in an industry that is oversaturated yes yes you to find something that is uniquely yours and and understand the territory you're on i think you know i just found um in America, your uniqueness is teased out of you. They, they want to find that one thing that is uniquely yours, and then they magnify it. So if you've got a bit of a lilt in your accent, a bit of an accent, or you're a bit Latino, they want they want more of it. Right. Make you more different. And when I got to England, it's literally the opposite. They, they, when they hear that difference, they know that you're going to stick out, and it's not going to be conducive to employment. So you need to you need to smooth that out. So you really you work on your accent, your elocution, you work on the RP, you work on styles. If you gesticulate too much while talking, they say you know you're moving your hands too much. It's distracting, and all this stuff, so that you so that you're able to be down the middle in a way that is useful to people. But then that fools you into thinking that what you need to do is be available to be anything for all people. But that's, that's not the way, that's not the way it works. You need to be something unique, but then present yourself in a way that is homogenized. And it that sounds like I'm judging it. I'm not, uh, it's just the way audience, different audiences are. And, uh, you know, you go to North Africa, they want different things from their performers that, uh, that, that we can't do. And, um, and uh, yeah, it all depends. You have to just uh, try and yeah, okay. Because it's not about us in the end; it's about the audience watching and what they want. And so yes. you give people what they want, really. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, how do you balance staying true to a character versus bringing your own unique interpretation to a role? Um, it's a very good. It's a, it's it's a good question because it's 
So the the, the answer I have is uh, they're both one and the same. Um, bring in your own interpretation. It is staying true to the character. Uh, ah. you know what I mean, it, 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 that is the job. Uh, they hire they hire you. So you've got to bring who you are to it and not be afraid of that. That's the that's the sort of magic trick. Well, that's the sort of difficult choice to make nowadays is making that decision to be who you are and bring that to a part and not be afraid of it. And when we audition, the audition process is sort of the all-consuming barrier to entry. You know, in many ways, actors are auditioners. They're not formers. We, our job is to audition, and try and get the part, and that's its own industry, right? And what, and what none of us like to do is take the risk and, and make a bold decision about the part based on who we are. Uh, especially if you don't actually know what you're trying to project specifically, like this niche thing I'm talking about. Yeah. But when you get an, when you get any opportunity, taking the risk that you can bring yourself to it fully is a way of really starting to churn the engine and being congruent with who you are and flowing and understanding and learning. There's, there's a real feedback loop that happens that allows you to grow properly so that, okay, you might not get this part today, but you the, the, the discussion that you were having, the feedback loop, loop that you were having with the person who you want to get the job from and you, that, that is real because you, you didn't obfuscate, you didn't, you didn't reserve, you didn't hold back and wait to see what they were going to, you know what I mean? You actually, yeah. you actually took that leap of faith and it is a leap of faith because we don't want to, we don't want to ruin our chances by, by making some sort of choice that is, but, but, you know, and it's all in town. We're all talking, we're talking about very subjective things here. You just have to, you just have to follow, follow that thread inside and, 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 and be brave enough to just, you know, jump in with both feet oh that's wonderful I think that's a great time to wrap up the interview now and I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on to the mighty dragon of course you're very welcome thank you for having me <laughs> all the best with your career and I look forward to seeing whatever you are in next I need to thank you very much. put my yeah. teeth back in <laughs> thank you so much you yes, thank, thank you. you very much Victoria appreciate bye-bye. it bye-bye